uh, just to very briefly, if anyone, any, a couple of people want to shout out any particular things that were shared. Um, Yes, yeah, so two linked points. So there are each buffer zone is slightly different. So I only really know how the legislation on the national one is being proposed, or at least mostly. So there are two things. One, it's anything that's being considered to influence women. So if the police officer thinks that you are in, if you're in that zone and you are Influencing now that's a very subjective measure. It's one of the things I have that significant concerns about the other um, Clause that could be is you are simply remaining in that place Now it doesn't actually matter what you're doing, but if you're remaining in that zone for, any, for without a good reason Yeah So so the buffer zones are a particular thing in relation to abortion clinics um, so on a local level they have been brought in under public space protection orders, which are local powers. They could be done in other areas, but they've been used as a tool in this relation. That's then been taken up on the national level to say, right, let's have this as a nationwide thing. It, was, it wasn't actually a government policy. It was brought in by an amendment, um, but the government have accepted it. Um, on other protests, What's interesting is that this is part of a law that is very much tightening up police powers in relation to all sorts of protest activity. Um, so there are actually, I think, some, I have some concerns over civil liberties, not, cons not around Christianity, not around abortion clinics, just about civil liberties around protest. I think it gives potentially the police too many preemptive powers to stop protests because I think there is a balance between a protest, for protests I think should be allowed, and for protests to be meaningful, they will cause disruption. Um, there is a point at which it is then reasonable for those protests to be stopped. Finding the line there is a balancing act, and I, at the moment the government are trying to shift it uh, towards giving the police more powers in that area. But it, it, it's quite controversial, not just among Christians, among many other civil liberty cancer campaigners are concerned about the proposals as well. Yeah, I'm, I do. And this is a total tangent, so I'm not going to take it beyond this one point. But <laughs> I, I don't know if anyone saw a program on BBC this week, about a panorama program around pregnancy crisis centres. Um, I know, like, I don't know anyone involved in any of the centres that were featured. I know people involved in other pregnancy crisis centres, one of which, which, which is fairly sure they were visited by the same journalist, um, but weren't shown. And their view is, well, we probably were not bad enough for them to, for it to be worth being shown. Um, I, what really struck me about that was that you did see a platform given to, um, it wasn't Marie Curie, it wasn't uh, Marie Stopes, it was uh, B-Pass in that case. Um, abortion providers to set out their case um, in fully set up interviews, whereas they did kind of gotcha secret footage cameras. Now, I do want to say that I think some of the practice captured wasn't particularly good practice. Um, 
Um, but I also don't really trust the BBC that what they showed was the full picture. So like, I don't want to necessarily endorse what was shown because I think they said some things that I would not want people to be saying in those clinics. But I also think there was very clearly an agenda behind that programme. So, like, if you want, it's it's annoying. It's annoying. <laughs> they they do have influence. Um, I'm I'm quite <coughs> like I'm a lobbyist. That's my job. So I think other people should be allowed to be lobbyists. Um, and to some extent, it just depends how good you are. And that's a bit. I don't want to be overly pragmatic. Um, I think sometimes Christians need to get better at doing it. And actually, I think that is is—it's the case for organizations. It's the case for churches. I think churches have a brilliant opportunity to build local relationships. Um, I, I think churches have a better opportunity than most places to build relationships with local councillors and local MPs that isn't always about big national policy issues, but it's just about what's going on in your community. Because MPs want to have connections. Um, and most MPs would happily come to a church or to a church event or to a service that your church provides. Um, like, be a bit sensible about what you're inviting them to, but I think there's some really good opportunities. Um, and actually, that can sometimes lead to a real shifting in relationships when MPs have an opportunity to see um, in practice something that they might otherwise have just formed a more prejudicial view about. So we're going to go for about another 10 minutes and then I'm going to take a short break and then just after four we'll come back and then we'll run through making sure we leave some time before five o'clock for questions. That's the plan. Um, so before we take that break, I'm just going to run through a few principles for sharing your faith in the workplace um, because I think it's often the place where it comes into play most acutely. I've lost my page. There we go. Um, we've already talked about this a bit today. It can be challenging in a workplace. Workplaces do vary and they are different. Um, but hopefully these five ideas that somewhat, they spell out speak. You have to work quite hard to make them spell out speak, but they do. Start with prayer. And that's the first one. Um, I think it's essential that we are praying for the people that we're working with. That we're doing that as we're speaking to them, but we're also doing that generally. We're praying for the people we work with. Um, and that we're also offering to pray with people. Um, sometimes people won't want to be prayed with, or they might say, yeah, you can pray with me later on your own, but not now. Like it might freak them out a bit if you want to pray with them there and then, but sometimes people will be open to that. Um, other times it'll be actually, no, can you do that? Yeah, pray for me, but do that when you get home. But people are often quite open to be prayed for. And I think that's a good way of helping people think about what you're doing. Again, context and sensitivity matters. If you're in a position of authority, if, you have a, if you're in a service relationship, whether it's in a hospital or other kind of small service contexts, again, much more care is needed. But if you're working with, a, if it's a colleague to colleague interaction, um, yeah, so every situation needs to be taken seriously. If, it's, if you're a boss and it's your employee, again, more care is needed, but start with prayer. Secondly, prioritize your work. I think we can do an awful lot by being good witnesses in the workplace, by doing our job well, by being committed to the work that we're doing. Um, <coughs> And I think that actually we can create a context where we are respected in the workplace by the work that we do, by being good employees. And actually, sometimes it might be that you can have a short conversation in a workplace, but if you're going to take it further, you, it just makes sense to do it outside the workplace because you've got work to do. But you might be able to start a conversation and say, actually, let's finish it at lunchtime or after work or on Saturday morning. Um, so I think prioritizing your work is important. Thirdly, explain your Christian faith. Sounds obvious. Um, but explain your faith as well. Tell, talk about what it means to you. 
um, how your faith has changed your life, what Jesus means. Um, and I think it's, you probably know this well, but it's good to have a, a culture of conversation. So it's not just you. You don't just hit play and therefore goes the five-minute monologue that you'd pre-prepared. Um, actually, it's a conversation. You talk to them. You hear what they're saying. You listen to the things that they're interested in. What's, as you're talking, what's actually interesting them? What are they responding to? And what are they starting to fall asleep at? Um, so having a conversation is really important. And I'll come back to this later. Making faith normal is one of the best things we can do in a workplace. Like, if it feels like an extreme or crazy thing, it's going to get harder and harder to have it as an authentic part of our workplace. But if it's just normal, if you talking about your faith is normal, if you talking about what you care about and are passionate about is normal, all of that helps. And it won't feel like a big deal if people start asking questions and you respond to them. Um, we should aim to build gospel bridges. And that is, like, what are the things that are going to help them hear the gospel? What are the things that they're interested in? What are the questions that they're asking? Um, it might be a controversial topic. It might be sexuality or gender. I, I, I think it's challenging when those are the link issues for people to start thinking and talking about the Christian faith because they might come to it with hostility, but actually they might not. They might have real questions. What are the areas where you're going to be able to help them connect to what you're saying and how can we we share Jesus story with compassion with kindness and with gentleness um, again I keep on coming back to this idea of posture our posture matters so much um, the law knowing what the law says and knowing our rights is important but knowing how to speak winsomely and with grace and compassion is vital to. Um, I think, yeah, I'm just, I'm reiterating what we've already said. And then finally, know when to stop. Like, maybe it's someone dozing off. Maybe there's a bit of aggression coming back. Maybe you've just been talking too long and you're in the workplace and you know you need to get on with your work. I think... In general, I would say, it's probably not your last opportunity to talk to them about the Christian faith. So don't worry if you don't say everything all at once. Um, and respect what someone else is. If, if someone is done with the conversation, respect them in that. If they've heard what they want to hear, if they're clearly wanting to go to the toilet or get a cup of tea and find their way out, just know when to stop. And I think that's doubly important if you are in a position of authority in a workplace, that you're not seen as abusing that by requiring someone to stay um, and listen to you. So those are, those are just a few pointers. Um, so before we go to a break, I just want to say a little bit about the Evangelical Alliance. I don't know how much people know. Um, we're a, we, start, we were founded in 1846, so we've been around for a while. Um, we work across the United Kingdom. We want to unite evangelical Christians and we want to give them a voice. Um, we do that in Parliament, we do that in the media, we do that in all different areas of society. We're a membership organisation. We are made up of around 3,000 churches, around five or 600 organisations, um, and then about 20,000 individual members. Um, if you want to become a member, you can. I've got some forms at the back. Um, if you do, I have a goodie box for you as well. I can get you. And the, the real attraction is you can get a brand new book if you become a member. Um, so my colleague, Phil Knox, has written this book called Best of Friends. Um, Phil is a brilliant evangelist. Um, his job for the EA is basically to be an evangelist, which is a great job. Um, he does a lot of preaching as well. Um, it's a great book about the importance of friendship. Um, I don't know if you've seen some of the studies. and He's quoted this quite a lot in the last week. It is healthier for your life to eat kebabs with friends than eat salad on your own. 
Your life chances are better eating a kebab with friends than eating salad on your own. Like friendship, like physically, it makes you better. Um, so that book's all about friendship. I've read half of it. Only came out two weeks ago, so that's my excuse. Um, we also, you'll also get a little trolley coin. Um, that's also very useful. Um, so yeah, if you want to become a member, you can do. The forms are there, or just talk to me, and you can find out more. Basically, apart from these boxes, which you only get if you become a member, everything else on that table is to go. So the less I have to take back, the better. Um, so do take copies of the resources, um, and then we'll be back in about 10 minutes to do the final session. <laughs>